All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to our virtual event space. So before we get started, Third Place Books would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the Duwamish people and the land itself. So welcome once again, everyone. My name is Ali, and I'm your host for this evening, and I am so excited to be introducing Tor Hansen here to discuss his new book, Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid. But before we get into the good stuff, I just want to quickly thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, as much as we miss having these events in the bookstore, it has been such a delight to expand this online program to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in and, of course, for buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. For those of you in the Seattle area, come on in if you'd like to get your hands on copies. All three of our locations are open, or you can place an order online and come pick them up in store. Or if you're not local, we of course do ship very happily. And once again, we are so, so grateful for your support. Um, while you're over on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up in the next few months, and if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases, our online book clubs, and of course, follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. And you know, we have a pretty good time on, the, on there, so definitely go see if there's something over there that's for you. Uh, speaking of social media, if you would like to check out some of our past virtual events, you can find most of them on our YouTube channel, including this event within the next couple of days. So if you'd like to see our other virtual events or share this one, go ahead and track us down over there. Um, so this evening, we are here for about an hour, and towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or bottom of your screen. It is different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. We would love to know where you're from or your favorite latest read. Um, but when it comes time for questions, please do make sure those end up in the Q&A so that we can most easily find them. Um, before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone of our commitment to ensuring the safety and well-being of event attendees and guest authors. So in our chat and question spaces, please do lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. Uh, there are auto-generated closed captions available from the menu at the top or bottom of your screen. Select the live transcript button to enable or disable them. And finally, should any technical issues arise, which you know, it could happen. Um, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them, and we so appreciate your patience and understanding. All right, and I think that that is all of my housekeeping. So without further ado, I am so, so thrilled to introduce Tor Hansen, a conservation biologist, Guggenheim Fellow, uh, Switzer Environmental Fellow, and author of award-winning books, including Buzz, Feathers, The Impenetrable Forest, and The Triumph of Seeds. He has co-hosted the PBS Nature Show uh, series, American Spring Live, and has appeared as a guest on many programs, including NPR's Fresh Air and Bookless with Nathan. C. Pearl, among many others. His academic work includes co-editorship of the volume Warfare Ecology, as well as dozens of papers. His popular articles and essays have appeared in many publications, including the Wall Street Journal, The American Scholar, The Guardian, HuffPost, and so many others. His newest book, the book we're all excited about this evening, is Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid, The Fraught and Fascinating Biology of Climate Change. It tells the story of how plants and animals are responding to climate change, adjusting, evolving, and sometimes dying out. So thank you so much for being here, Tor. I'm so excited to listen in on this conversation. Uh, if you need anything, of course, give me a shout. I will be listening. Uh, same goes for all of you in the audience. If anything comes up, I will will be in chat. And with that, I'm going to pass the stage off to you. So thank welcome. you, Allie. And, and uh, that was a nice introduction. And I want to thank 
everyone at third place for inviting me. And of course, all of you for tuning in. I know we wish we were all in the same room probably, but that day will come again. And in the meanwhile, we can thank the Zoom gods for this virtual opportunity. And what I want to do right away is jump into the Zoom world by attempting the feat of sharing my screen. And I'm going to do it uh, in an advanced way that I learned from my sister-in-law called sharing a portion of my screen. And with that, I'm very much hoping that all of you see a book cover at this very moment. Um, so this is uh, the cover, of course, of the book, and it's the title, really, of our lecture tonight as well. And I want to jump right into that topic, the biology of climate change, with a very familiar image, uh, one that I think we have all come to know over the past several decades. It is the polar bear stranded on a melting iceberg. Now, this has really become our go-to symbol for the biological impacts of climate change, so much so that I believe the conversation far too often stops there. Uh, we invoke the poor polar bear in public discourse and in articles and in news stories of all kinds, and then we move on, overlooking this rich and vital biological backstory that really is at the heart of all climate change scenarios. I mean, after all, what matters most is not so much the change itself as the response to the change. If every species got along just as well in all conditions, then tweaking the weather wouldn't matter in the slightest. But of course, that's not how nature works. The diversity of life on Earth is based upon specialization. It's this great accumulation of species that have adapted to particular environmental niches and conditions. And when you change the environment, those species will react. And it is the sum of those reactions that will determine the future, theirs as well as our own. So what I want to do this evening is to focus on the challenges that climate change creates for plants and animals and how we can already see and measure their responses playing out all around us. We won't be talking too much about the process of climate change, the sort of atmospheric stuff, with one notable exception, carbon dioxide. Has there ever been a substance so often invoked and so seldom explained. Before I began this project, I realized that, wait a minute, I hardly know anything about the stuff that is making the planet warm in the first place. I mean, yes, I remember the diagram from my high school chemistry textbook, which pictured, uh, you know, this big black ball in the middle, the carbon atom, bookended by two little red balls, the, the oxygen atoms. And at the time, I recall thinking that it looked precisely like the face of the red-eyed fruit flies that we had been spending the past semester studying in biology. So the spitting image of a fruit fly. And that really stuck with me, that association, so that later when this link between CO2 and climate change became notorious, all I could picture in my mind was the world's tailpipes and smokestacks emitting these huge hordes and clouds of tiny flies, which is a very vivid image, but not exactly helpful in trying to understand what is going on. Because Carbon dioxide is a bit of a paradox. It really is a bit of a paradox. It is a global threat, but it also happens to be one of the building blocks for life on Earth. It's everywhere, which helps explain why it was the first atmospheric gas ever to be described. Before the discovery of carbon dioxide, scientists weren't sure what the atmosphere was or if it was anything. Was there even anything there to measure? It was a point up for debate until CO2 was discovered. Now, credit for that discovery goes in large part to this fellow here, Joseph Priestley, who was an 18th century English clergyman. He was a chemist. He was a philosopher. He was a, a good friend of Benjamin Franklin. He was an all-around polymath at the time. 
And he credits his discovery and his work upon uh, carbon dioxide to the fact that he was, quote, living for some time in the neighborhood of a public brewery. The vicarage where he was working was right next door to the town brewery. And he found there quantities and clouds of this colorless, odorless gas that was collecting above the fermentation vats. And luckily, he also found brewers who were patient enough to let him build these scaffolds over the top of their fermentation vats and then lower all manner of experiments into that invisible cloud so he could study it. And he learned all sorts of things. He learned that it would snuff out a candle flame and that whatever it was, this gas must be heavy because he could see the smoke from the flame uh, going down towards the brewery floor. And he saw that small animals and insects could not breathe this gas. And he found that he could dissolve it in water, producing in that process a fizzy beverage with what he called a pleasant acidulous taste. And he published that as a paper, and it won him the prestigious Copley Medal from the Fellows of the Royal Society of London. But I can tell you it won a lot more, if you will, for an entrepreneur named uh, Johann Schwepp, who read that paper, copied Priestley's methods, and founded the soda water and tonic water company that still bears his name. So... Priestley's work paved the way for all sorts of other scientists to dig in and study carbon dioxide. And they began learning all kinds of additional things. They learned that it would retain radiant heat, would heat up and hold on to that heat. And they learned as early as the 1890s that industrial activities at the time were already adding enough of it to the atmosphere uh, to warm the planet in the 1890s, so a long time ago. Of course, that work was done in snowy Sweden, where the idea of warming the planet by a few degrees was generally greeted with gusto. Now, people have known then for a long time that CO2 was a greenhouse gas, but it still doesn't explain why some of it is bad and some of it is benign. And I really wanted to get my head around that distinction. So I conducted a little home experiment, if you will, with my son, Noah, on various contents of our refrigerator. And I would like to read that section of the book to you now, or a portion of it at least, which comes from the second chapter. And it begins with a quotation attributed to Galileo, who said, we must measure all that is measurable and strive to make measurable all that is not. It turns out that fermentation occurs in a lot more places than vats of beer. Yogurt and cheese makers call it culturing, but it's more accurate to think of it as a form of slow microbial digestion, a way for bacteria and other tiny organisms to extract and use energy from the foods they live within and around. Like any form of digestion, it is a process that produces waste. But luckily for food lovers, the byproducts of fermentation include things like alcohol, thus the beer, and lactic acid, which adds tanginess and pungency to such cultured favorites as kimchi and buttermilk. Most fermentation also produces carbon dioxide, which is what had me combing through the back reaches of our fridge. A container containing organic sauerkraut advertised probiotic punch and claimed it's alive. But any organisms that the kraut might have once contained had long since shuffled off their mortal coils and were no longer producing a whiff of carbon dioxide. A lit match held above that briny mix burned brightly. Experiments with yogurt and sour cream were similarly disappointing, but then we hit the jackpot. On the bottom shelf, Behind the bags of carrots and celery sat a half-gallon jar of homemade pickles. They had been stewing in their own juices since August and tasted yeasty as well as sour, suggesting that fungi had joined the bacteria in their digestive pursuits. Frankly, it was past time to throw the pickles out, but for once, procrastinating a chore had paid off. As soon as Noah and I brought a match near that open lid, the flame demonstrated why carbon dioxide is such a common ingredient in fire extinguishers. 
With no oxygen to burn, the match went out in an instant, as if we'd turned off a switch. What's more, smoke from the snuffed tip curled downward, trapped in the gas, just as Priestley had described. It's pouring down the side, Noah exclaimed, watching as wisps of smoke followed the heavy vapors over the jar rim and down to spread across the countertop. That's it, I told him. You saw the carbon dioxide. He quickly brought me back to earth. I didn't see the carbon dioxide, Papa. I saw the smoke. But like Priestley before us, we could use that smoke to watch the gas, defining its boundaries as it flowed and swirled around that open jar. For a few minutes, our kitchen was filled with the thrill of discovery as we lit match after match, watching them snuff and smolder until all the carbon dioxide had dissipated into the surrounding air. Simple experiments often lead to broader insights, and repeating Priestley's fermentation trick brought up an obvious question. Do pickles cause climate change? Does making beer? The answer, of course, is no. But understanding why some carbon emissions are harmless while others are not reveals a basic truth about climate change that we rarely stop to think about. In the case of our pickle jar, the carbon came from the cucumbers in the brine and the cucumbers had gotten it from the air around our garden the previous summer. Like plants everywhere, their growth relied upon photosynthesis, that leafy process of combining carbon dioxide and water with energy from the sun to create starches. In other words, carbon dioxide puts the carbo in carbohydrates. And when those starches break down, the earth's Uh, the carbon dioxide goes back into the atmosphere. And it is the step in the Earth's carbon cycle that we are most familiar with because we play a role in it every moment of every day. Whether we eat plants or eat animals that have eaten plants, uh, the energy that fuels our bodies traces right back to those photosynthetic starches and we release carbon dioxide with every exhaled breath. But in terms of climate change, Breathing is like making pickles or brewing beer, guilt-free. That's because our bodies are just one short stop for carbon on its continuous circuit from the air through plants and animals and back again with no net gain or loss. If that's all there was to the story, then the planet wouldn't be warming and I wouldn't be giving this lecture. The reality of modern climate change hinges on one key fact, not all plants break down. Consider the pickle. Cucumbers eaten fresh or left to rot in the garden compost release their carbon right away, but that process slows down considerably in a jar of salty brine. Under the right conditions, it can stop altogether. In nature, this occurs primarily in two locations, the ocean floor and boggy wetlands. When marine algae die and sink and mass to the seabed, they sometimes get buried before they are eaten or decomposed. Dead plants and bogs can also accumulate with little decay, forming layer upon layer of peat. In either case, if sediments and rocks develop above and around these organic deposits, their carbon is effectively trapped and removed from the atmosphere for millions of years. Transformed by heat and pressure, we recognize these ancient plants as the fossil fuels, petroleum from the algae, coal from the peat, and natural gas, which can come from either. So when we burn them now, we are returning all of those millions of years of stockpiled carbon dioxide to the air at one time, overwhelming the natural cycle and leading to all of the consequences now unfolding. So the next time you find something at the back of the fridge that looks like a scientific experiment, it is a scientific experiment. There is a lot to be learned uh, in a jar of rotting pickles. And it's a good reminder for us that even the atmospheric aspects of modern climate change are rooted in biology. So we know that the climate is warming and we know why, but what does all of that mean for plants and animals? As you can imagine, That is a booming field of study. It's not too much of an exaggeration now to say that all biologists are studying climate change. Some of them just don't know it yet. It is that far reaching in nature. 
Um, so it helps to organize this deluge of information into themes. And one of the most common themes has to do with timing. At Walden Pond, for example, the violets and wood sorrel that Henry David Thoreau admired in May and June now bloom by late April. And what he called the early yellow smell of willows can reliably be savored in March. Spring is arriving earlier and earlier. You can see it happen in your own backyard. And if you write your observations down, as Thoreau did, they might one day become valuable. His meticulous notes on the plants and birds at Walden are now a vital baseline for modern comparisons. One expert told me that if Thoreau was listed as a co-author on all the papers now using his data, he would be one of the most prolific climate change scientists of the 21st century. But a modern spring isn't just earlier than what Thoreau saw, it's different. To Thoreau, it might seem like a season in disarray. And that's because not all species are responding in the same ways or even at the same times. This flower, for example, is a familiar early spring site in meadows throughout the Pacific Northwest. Uh, this is a flower known as death camas. Like many plants, death camas produces toxins to ward off would-be attackers. But unlike most other plants, it doesn't just put those chemicals into leaves or other places likely to be nibbled. It puts them everywhere, including in its pollen and its nectar. And what's more, the main toxin in that mix, zygosine, is especially nasty stuff. It attacks the heart, it attacks the lungs, and for good measure, it attacks the digestive tract. Its Latin name for this plant uh, really says it all. It's called Toxicoscordion venenosum venenosum, which translates to poisonous bulb, poisonous, poisonous. So death camas is very well protected, but in terms of pollination, that puts it in a bit of a bind. I mean, how do you attract insects to your flowers when instead of a tasty reward, you are offering them seizures, paralysis, and well, death. Enter the appropriately named death camas bee, one of only a handful of insects and the only bee that has figured out the trick of detoxifying or tolerating that death camas poison. So that trick now has given the bee an exclusive source of pollen and nectar, and it gives the flower a dedicated pollinator. It's a very tight and very specialized, co-evolved and co-dependent, for that matter, relationship. But in many locations, death camas now blooms weeks earlier than it did just 30 years ago, responding to the steady rise in springtime air temperatures. The bee, on the other hand, nests in the ground where things are warming more slowly and it's still on the old schedule. And if that trend continues, it threatens to pull these two codependent species apart, not in space, but in time, creating what biologists call a timing mismatch. The bee uh, too late for its flower, the flower too early for its bee. So specialized relationships like pollination and uh, for specialized plants and bees and so forth, those are one of the places that, that climate change biologists focus and really worry about the long-term consequences. But it's cropping up, this same sort of timing problem is cropping up in all kinds of unexpected places. Up in the Arctic, you see herds of caribou migrating to their calving grounds and arriving after the peak of plant production that they were counting upon to feed and, and raise their young. Similarly, Shorebirds in migration in some locations now hit the uh, tide flats past the peak of the invertebrates that they were relying upon to fuel the next stage of their journey. Timing mismatches playing out in all sorts of habitats, but it can take years or even decades to really sort out the ultimate results of these kind of timing problems. There are other challenges that climate change produces that are more immediate, extremes, if you will, in weather, which we have recently experienced here in the Pacific Northwest in terms of the heat waves, the heat dome that sat over our part of the continent for days and days last summer. 
we are now familiar with this, but other places in the world are also experiencing extremes, storms, floods, droughts, and oftentimes just higher and higher temperatures. As one biologist told me, sometimes organisms get too hot. It's simple. You don't have to have a timing mismatch if they just overheat. And one such example comes to us from a rather surprising location, the deserts of the American Southwest, where you might expect creatures to be well prepared for a warmer world. They're living in a hot desert after all. This story is from Barry Sinerva, who is a herpetologist at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And he studies lizards, including this wonderful lizard, the, the Western fence lizard, which if your childhood was anything like mine, was a very frustrating species because no matter how hard you tried to catch it, it would scuttle away under a nearby rock. Well, it turns out that fence lizards use rocks for far more than, than evading young lizard enthusiasts. No, they are what biologists call heliotherms. They use the sun to thermoregulate, to control their body temperature. So they bask on the top of rocks when they need to warm up, and then they scurry below rocks into the shade when they need to cool down. They can't just remain out in the sun indefinitely because their, their bodies can't compensate for that heat and they would overheat and ultimately perish. So as the temperatures have begun to rise, particularly in the hotter parts of the deserts that they call home, these prime reptile habitats, the lizards have responded by doing what they've always done on hot days. They spend more time in the shade, but that comes at a cost because the more time you spend hiding under rocks, the less time you have to be out looking for food. And it's a clear relationship then. As temperatures rise, the calories taken in by fence lizards start to go down. And there's a critical point there where matters uh, where, if, if you will, the rubber meets the road in terms of biology. And Barry and his team had seen populations of fence lizards wink out in a number of locations before they actually realized what was going on. It wasn't the heat killing them directly, but as the lizards spent more time in the shades, in the shade, they weren't getting enough to eat, particularly the females. We're not getting enough calories to build up the energy reserves they needed to reproduce. So as temperatures began to rise, if they get too hot, uh, the lizards stop breeding. And you don't really need a PhD in herpetology to predict the long-term consequences of that. So another theme, if you will, in climate change biology has to do with what fans of the Jungle Book might call bare necessities of life. The simple bare necessities. What happens when some critical element of a species habitat just disappears? This is more or less what we're talking about with that polar bear on the melting iceberg because polar bears hunt for seals on pack ice. And if you remove the pack ice from that equation, the polar bears lose their favorite hunting grounds, a critical part of their habitat. But if you could look beyond the seals and polar bears to the edge of those ice flows, you would see another creature threatened by the loss of ice, a wonderful little seabird called the little auk or dovekey. And dovekeys historically have fed at that margin where the ice is melting, which is a place that is rich with the plankton that they feed upon. This has been a marvelous strategy for them until the pack ice began to retreat farther and farther from the islands where dovekeys breed, like this archipelago, the Franz Josefland archipelago in Russia. And the dovekeys then have long been predicted to be an early victim of climate change because as that ice gets farther and farther away, they have farther and farther to fly, to get food, to bring back, to feed to their chicks. And you can imagine that at some critical distance, it would simply be too far. They couldn't make it back with enough food, the chicks would starve. And uh, much like our collapse of fence lizard populations, you would see the end of breeding and that consequence. Uh, but that brings us to an important point. And that is that dove keys and other species are not 
passive bystanders when their environment changes. Nature is not defenseless in every case. And sometimes the responses of these species catch everyone by surprise. So let's catch up with the Dove Key story um, by another short passage straight out of the book. And this comes to us from a scientist, French scientist uh, named David Grimelet, who participated in an expedition to that remote archipelago, Franz Joseph Land. We had indeed strong hypotheses and predictions on how they would behave, Grimelet explained, noting that birds in previous studies had regularly flown over 60 miles to reach the edge of the pack ice. We were expecting flight times between the colony and the foraging spot of at least an hour, he went on, and then recounted what he called, quote, one of the most exciting moments in my research career. Sitting with their laptops at the dinner table, at the research station, surrounded by their Russian counterparts, they opened up the first batch of tracking data and saw precisely how long the birds had been in the air. Less than four minutes. Instead of trekking all the way to the edge of the sea ice, the Dove Keys had apparently found an alternative food source right on their very doorstep. But what and where? It's easy to imagine the excited conjecture and conversation that came next, perhaps fortified with a sip or two of vodka. Soon their ideas began coalescing around an entirely new theory. My colleague, Jerome Fort, remembered what we had seen while climbing the nearby mountain with our Russian friends a week before, Gremelet recalled, and described a distinct line across the mouth of the fjord where cloudy blue meltwater from island glaciers slammed into the dark, dense currents of the Arctic Ocean. Both Fort and Gremelet had trained as oceanographers before they began studying birds, so they understood the consequences of such an abrupt transition. We both knew what this front meant, a curtain of plankton, killed by temperature and osmotic shock. For tiny crustaceans, swimming so suddenly from one kind of water into another was like driving full speed into a wall. And for anything that fed upon those crustaceans, the resulting pileup created a bonanza. Testing their th theory, however, required a boat, and the only craft available was a, quote, chronically inflate deflated dinghy and the fuel they'd brought from Mermanx turned out to be contaminated with water. None of this was exactly ideal for exploring a polar sea, but they set off anyway and managed to sputter far enough out into the fjord for a survey. There wasn't much to see at first, but as they crossed the convergence between glacial melt and ocean water, the Dove Keys were suddenly all around them. The little auks were all there, Gremelet told me, aligned on the oceanic side, diving and stuffing themselves on plankton, easily picked from that underwater curtain. And with that revelation, the story of Dove Keys and climate change switched from one of decline to one of resilience. Yes, the sea ice was melting as predicted, but so were Arctic glaciers. And in places like Franz Josef Land, where the glaciers are plentiful, that created an opportunity that no one saw coming. Gremelet and his team spent the remainder of their field season showing that Dove Keys weren't just surviving on their new food source, they were thriving. Chicks grew at precisely the same rate as they had on a traditional diet, measured decades earlier at the same location. To Gremelet, the project demonstrated how one overlooked detail can have a huge effect on the outcome. Even if you think you know, he summarized, you really have to get out into the field to check what wild creatures are doing because they very often surprise you. David Gremelet's story, embodies something I heard again and again during my research for this book, how scientists went into the field expecting to study one thing and ended up studying something else because conditions on the ground were so different from what they expected. Different in terms of climate, but also different in terms of the lives and the activities of their subjects. The Dove Keys were able to pivot quickly to a new food source because they have what scientists call plasticity. Like the old cartoon character, Plastic Man, they are inherently flexible. Uh, they have a built-in ability to stretch themselves and find ways to adapt. And in an era of rapid change, this plasticity allows a rapid response. We wish that all species had it in abundance. Because for some species, it applies to even more than simply behavior. 
The Humboldt squid, for example, virtually disappeared from traditional fishing grounds in Mexico's Gulf of California after a series of climate-driven marine heat waves, or so everybody thought, until surveys found that they were not only still present, they were more abundant than ever. Instead of departing for cooler waters to find their comfort zone, they had responded to the heat stress by adopting a radically different life strategy. They, yes, ate different foods, they changed their behavior, but they also changed their bodies. They matured and reproduced in half the time, living only half as long. And under those constraints, their new adult bodies could reach only a fraction of their former size, too small to bite on the hooks that had formerly been used to catch them. Their rapid downsizing took everyone by surprise, including the fishers who had been dismissing the few they could hook as juveniles or perhaps even another species. They'd been throwing them back. Now, most climate change responses that we have measured to date in nature are the results, one way or another, of plasticity. Some capabilities that were already baked into a species' genetic makeup. However, in some tantalizing examples, there are signs now of climate-driven evolution playing out in real time. And one of the best comes to us from the Caribbean, another lizard, if you can believe it. This time, a small lizard called an anole, which is a distant cousin to an iguana. And the story comes to us from Colin Donahue, who is now at Washington University. Uh, but he had just years, several years ago, surveyed this lizard population in the Turks and Caicos Islands in the Caribbean. It was part of a larger project where the idea was to remove non-native rats from these islands, these Norway rats, same species we have pestering us here in the Northwest. Well, they had infested these islands and, and they were eating lizards and doing all sorts of other damage. So the idea was measure the lizards and other native flora and fauna uh, and then get rid of the rats and then go back in and see how the native ecosystem responded. So he'd measured all these lizards, but then a hurricane struck and his research took a turn. So let's catch up with that story from chapter eight from the book, which also begins with a quotation, this time from Giuseppe Lampedusa's novel, The Leopard, where he wrote, if we want things to stay as they are, things will have to change. Actually, it was two hurricanes, Donahue clarified, when I called to ask him how the story played out. Hurricane Irma struck first, pummeling the eastern Caribbean with torrential rains, storm surge, and category five winds exceeding 175 miles per hour. Just two weeks later, Hurricane Maria swept through with similar force. The combined storms devastated low-lying islands like the ones where Donahue's lizards lived uprooting trees, flattening structures, and leaving both natural and human communities reeling. Needless to say, researchers put the rat project on an indefinite hold, but for Donahue, that setback also offered an opportunity. While his questions about lizards and rats would have to wait, uh, he was now in the perfect position to study the effects of hurricanes. Had any lizards survived? And if so, were the survivors measurably different from the population that he had just measured? We had no idea what to expect, he told me, but I knew we weren't going to get another chance at that kind of data. So he cobbled together some funding, headed back to the Caribbean, and found himself in a sort of scientific deja vu, repeating the exact same field study that he'd just completed six weeks earlier. We were on a short timeline, so it was pretty much catching and measuring lizards all day long, he recalled. But Don Hubert described that trip with obvious pleasure, as if this were precisely how anyone would want to spend their time on a tropical island. In conversation, Don Hugh's enthusiasm for science borders on exuberance. He comes across as someone who probably keeps working and thinking long after most of us would quit for the day and retire to the poolside bar. That may be why he recognized the potential value of returning so soon to resurvey his lizards. And it's almost certainly why it occurred to him to bring along a leaf blower. The customs officer was very confused, he said, and laughed out loud at the memory of trying to explain the science behind traveling with a large piece of landscaping equipment. 
We needed to know how the lizards behaved in hurricane force winds, he told me. It was possible they might hunker down in the tree roots. We didn't know. And since watching lizards in a real hurricane was out of the question, Donahue used the leaf blower to simulate, to simulate one inside his hotel room. And I have to say, I've always wondered what the people in the next room thought about that. I mean, it's one thing if someone turns on the TV loud about a leaf blower. Hmm. So fortunately, Colin was kind enough to loan to me a video of that experiment so that we can all see what he saw. And before I play it, let me assure you that no lizards were harmed. There is a soft net off camera and all the lizards were safely caught and uh, returned to the wild within an hour or two of the experiment. Uh, so without further ado then, let me present to you a hurricane lizard. The wind begins and you can see the back legs starting to slip free and then, oh, the lizard is flapping out in the wind. The wind picks up, holding on for dear life, hurricane force until finally, ah, the hurricane lizard blown off of its stick. Now, in addition to getting quite a few hits when he put it on YouTube, this video perfectly explained what Colin had seen in his data because the post-hurricane lizard population was different. They were measurably different from the lizards he had just surveyed. The survivors had several things in common. They all had um, larger topads, large, measurably larger topads for holding on tight to the stick during those hurricane force winds. And they had stronger, larger front legs for gripping that stick, but they also had shorter back legs, which was a bit of a mystery for Colin until he saw the video. Then he understood that when the lizard's bodies were flapping out like a flag in the wind, having short back legs reduced drag on the body, uh, giving the lizards the ability to hang on for just a few seconds longer, which in some cases was the difference between survival of the fittest and perishing. And so he realized at the end of this study that what he had captured in his data was an example of natural selection in action, evolution playing out not over the course of centuries or thousands of years, but within a single field season. He returned later and showed how those same traits were being passed on to the next generation. And then he took a broad view of this situation, tracked all the places where strong hurricanes are most common in the Caribbean and wherever strong hurricanes occur commonly, the lizards have these traits. A wonderful example of climate-driven evolution playing out in real time. And climate change biology is full of just that sort of a surprise. And I hope you will agree with me that there's a lot more to it than just a lonely polar bear on an iceberg. Now, we've been talking this evening all about the challenges that, that it creates for plants and animals, things like timing mismatches. We've talked about extreme weather. And I have to tell you, we haven't even scratched the surface in terms of what's going on out there. Consider movement, for example, which for many species is the first line of defense against climate change. If it gets too hot, or uncomfortable where you are, if you're out of your comfort zone, then if you have the ability to move, you move. And biologists have already measured over 30,000 climate-driven range shifts playing out across the world as species fan out across landscapes and across oceanscapes looking for the conditions that they're used to. It's estimated that between 25 and 85 percent of species on the planet are already on the move even at the low end, that's a quarter of all life on Earth. So these climate-driven upheavals in movement and behavior and plasticity, they're creating all kinds of conflicts and new situations uh, in ecological processes, creating novel ecosystems with species that haven't interacted before, affecting common ecological things like predation and hybridization, parasitism, uh, disease prevalence, and yes, even extinction. 
The mouse-like bramble keys malomies in Australia recently became the first mammal species confirmed as a climate change casualty when all of its known habitat was inundated by sea level rise. So studying climate change biology does not necessarily make scientists worry less about the crisis, but it can help them to worry smart. Allocating scarce resources in terms of research effort, conservation effort, and policy to the species and systems that need our help the most. That's important scientifically, but it's important at a personal level too, as we all struggle to allocate our limited emotional capital to this crisis. We too need to know what to worry about. Yes, climate change is a daunting crisis, but I argue that it deserves our curiosity as well as our concern. After all, it's hard to solve a problem if you aren't even interested in it. Now, in a moment, I will take your questions, and I hope you have dreamed up some good climate change biology questions for me this evening. Uh, but first, I want to end with a passage from the conclusion to the book, which also begins with a quotation, this time from the bard himself, from Shakespeare, who wrote in King John, strong reasons make strong actions. I subscribe to a philosophy expressed to me by Gordon Orions, an eminent American biologist whose seven decade career has spanned everything from blackbird behavior to the evolution of fear. When asked what a concerned citizen should do to combat climate change, his response was immediate and concise, everything you can. In that simple phrase, Orions managed to capture both urgency and agency the seriousness of the issue combined with the importance of taking action at a relevant scale. It's not a new idea. 19th century thinker Edward Everett Hale expressed something similar in a verse conceived long before anyone was worried about their carbon footprint. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something, he wrote. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. The value of the advice from both Orions and Hale lies in their choice of the word can, a verb rooted in possibility and adaptable to any circumstance. It helps us to focus our energy on tasks immediately at hand, tangible things like how we drive, shop, eat, travel, protest, vote, dry the laundry, or even cut the grass. Naysayers will claim that taking personal action is trivial, an empty gesture in the face of a problem so large. But that position is wrong, and not just slightly wrong, it is the opposite of the truth. In nature, we have seen how the responses of individual organisms determine the fates of populations, of species, and even entire ecological communities. And the same pattern applies to society. Addressing climate change requires a fundamental cultural shift in our relationship with energy, from how we produce it to how much of it our lifestyles demand. That makes individual action more important, not less so, because it is the collective behaviors and attitudes of individuals that define and change a culture. Yes, we need stronger climate policies and strong leadership to carry them forward, but those things will be the results of cultural change, not the cause of it. Doing everything one can about climate change is also a fitting approach biologically because that is precisely what plants and animals are doing. Their responses are playing out all around us every day, a constant thrumming call to action. Because in spite of the complexity of our societies and the technologies we surround ourselves with, in the end, we're just one more species on a changing world, facing the same climate challenges and drawing on the same basic toolbox of potential solutions with one notable difference. Unlike any other organism on the planet, people have the ability to do more than simply react to climate change. If we so choose, we can alter the behaviors that are causing it to happen. Thank you all very much. With that, I'm going to turn it over to any questions that you may have. Hi, that was so wonderful. I, I, you can't hear us clapping, but I promise I was, I'm sure the rest of them were too. The virtual <laughs> clapping, oh, very good. Exactly, Thanks. exactly, Zoom clapping. <laughs> so I have a question here from Claudia. 
this is Tor, do you think, or what do you think about the technology of sucking CO2 out of the air? Does this really do anything of consequence to help reverse climate change, or is it too tiny a drop in the bucket? Great question, Claudia. It's, it doesn't do anything yet. Um, but in terms of our response to climate change, I am very much of the all of the above approach. Yeah. I remember hearing years ago, uh, someone critical uh, of, a, of, a, of a politician who called climate change an, or an engineering problem. Um, and I thought to myself, and I heard, well, my brother's an engineer. We need engineers thinking about climate change. At least they're recognizing that it's a problem. I, I don't see it, a, you know, that I said, well, wait a minute, we need engineers on this, right? So I think that the engineering fixes are an important part of of the potential solutions. It's not gonna do everything. Even if you had great uh, carbon scrubbing uh, air cleaners, we need to do a lot more than that. But if it can be a component of the solution and a way to clean up some of the problems we've done, I'm all for it. But fundamentally, what we're really talking about is this shift in our whole relationship to uh, energy, right? And how we think about it, how we use it, how we produce it. And as a demonstration of that, I think it, it involves almost an act of remembrance because energy used to be a lot more precious to us than it is now. Now, with a name like mine, Tor Hansen, here in the Pacific Northwest, it probably won't surprise you that I have Scandinavian heritage. And there's an old joke that floated around in our family um, about old Ole, you know, living on the farm in North Dakota, and he had a wonderful long life there. And when Ole was lying upon his deathbed, he was a beloved member of the family. Everyone gathered around to say their goodbyes. And he was there and he looked up and he said, is Lena here? And everyone assured him, yes, yes, Ole, Lena is here. Everyone's here. And then he said, is Klaus here? Yes, Ole, Ole Klaus is here. And then he asked, is Olga here? And and Regina, and he started to go through all the members of the family and Ole, Ole, and finally you know, he was getting upset and they, they assured him that Ole, no, the whole family is here in the bedroom with you. And he looked up and he said, then why is the light on in the kitchen? And I love that joke. It's a gentle humor, a play upon the frugality of the old Norwegian farmer, but it reminds us that it's not too long ago that electricity was a precious commodity to all of us. The Rural Electrification Project in this country was enacted in uh, 1936, less than a century ago. So when electricity came to rural areas, people treated it as a precious, precious resource. And we all need to recapture that attitude towards energy and think more like Oli in how we use it. Great question, thank you. A plus joke, A plus. <laughs> so I'm not seeing any more questions from the audience, uh, but we do have a little bit more time. So if anybody has anything that they haven't put in the Q&A yet, now's your chance. In the meantime, I have a question. Um, so you have written about a lot of subjects in the natural world, obviously, um, but what sparked your interest in climate change biology? Like where did, what was the seed for this book? Ah, uh, well, it really is not one thing, but a whole series of things in that if I look back over my career, I collected my undergraduate degree as a young scientist in the spring of 1992 at the precise moment when the delegates were gathering in Rio for the first, uh, for, for the Earth Summit. And it was the first time that a climate change uh, declaration, you know, was signed, a treaty, if you will. Uh, and it marked a transition, really, where this crisis shifted from more of an academic subject to more of something in the public eye that everyone was beginning, at least, to be concerned about. And I have seen that same sort of transition now take place in biology in project after project where climate change has risen to the fore, studying one thing and realizing that we needed to include this overarching factor that was impacting our results. 
Uh, and so I think I'm not alone in the world of biology. That has been a theme for all of us over the past several decades until now. Uh, you know, I talked to one graduate student for this book who had just finished his work, fascinating project on bears up on Kodiak Island. But he said, I said, I didn't want to study climate change. He said, it's, it's almost a cliche to be studying climate change now, but he went out into the field and his project turned into a very intriguing uh, uh, discovery about bears and, and climate change. So it really is this pervasive thing in biology and it's hard to get away from it. And so seeing that taking place, seeing all of these fascinating stories and discoveries that really have an impact on how we think about climate change, there's a lot to be learned from these stories, and then being frustrated by the limited amount of discourse in the public eye on climate. It's the polar bear, and then the, nothing else. And we're back to arguing about, uh, you know, about policy. I really saw a hole that I thought a book could fill to try to broaden our discussion on these very important biological impacts. Thank you. So I'm going to ask one more question. Audience, this is your last chance because we're about at the end of our evening. Um, so we've heard some somewhat dire climate information tonight and in general, I think. Um, but we've heard some really hopeful information too. How do you balance uh, like hope and concern in, as you study and as you write? Sure, I think it's a it's something that we all struggle with, and I think that's one of the the take home messages from climate change biology is the power of curiosity in addressing a problem of this kind. It's tempting to give in to despair when you have such a large problem uh, out there; it can seem overwhelming. But despair is not a particularly useful response. Where curiosity, by its very nature, leads to learning and to action. And so I often think about this you know, idea of taking action for climate change as an individual, sort of the way you might try to help a friend who's going through a bad patch. Maybe there has been an illness in the family or a death even, or uh, some other real challenge that you can't fix by yourself. It's a bigger problem than what you can do as a friend, but you want to do something to help. And you find a way. You prepare a meal and take it over, or you do some errands for them, or you, you mow the lawn. You do some little thing that does help this friend of yours through their bad patch, and they appreciate it. It's a real tangible help to them. That does two things, right? It's helping them, but it also makes you feel better because you found a way to help. And when you do something that makes you feel good, it makes you want to do more of it. In biology, we call that a positive feedback loop when some action leads to feedback that causes that to continue and to grow. And I really think we need that positive feedback in our personal responses to climate change. Finding ways to take action, make us feel a little better that have a tangible result and we build upon that. And when you multiply that across a population, you start to see real change. So I believe very much in finding those positive feedback loops in our response. Thank you. <laughs> so our last question is gonna be from Emily, uh, who says, what's your next project? Oh, Emily, yes, I'm hard <laughs> at work already. Um, so I'm fascinated. It's sort of a pendulum swing. I've been very global with the climate change work. And now I'm really looking close to home. And I'm fascinated by the biology that we can see around us, the biology of our backyards, our parks, and nearby spaces, the things we tend to overlook as we get through our busy days. What can we see close by? And then also how can our observations inform science in a broader way? We have seen in recent years, particularly, you know, as we've all been stuck at home over the past uh, year and a half, uh, or stuck at home more than usual, um, how that has led to an increase in observation. People seeing all kinds of natural events in their yards and in their neighborhoods that they didn't know were going on. But that combines with something important, a trend in science over the past decade or so, in terms of in involving 
the community in doing science, not just gathering data, but coming up with ideas, a real exchange between scientists and citizen scientists. And this is possible in part through the improvements we have now in technology, where it's very possible to share things immediately from all sorts of geographic locations, contribute to these massive data sets that scientists had no way to really gather beforehand. So it's possible now that as we become more familiar with the nature close to home, we can use our knowledge to advance science on things like climate change studies, as well as a range of other basic ecological processes that we couldn't have studied in this way before. So I see it as a really fascinating trend in science and then also in our personal lives, how we can recapture something of the nature of our backyards and use that to advance human knowledge. I love that. I can't wait. I can't wait to see it. So we I are about at the, we're at the top of our hour here. So it's about time that we call it a night. I'm just going to take this last minute to say thank you so much, Tor, for being here. Uh, this was so wonderful uh, and sharing this information with us. Claudia says, thank you for this excellent work you are doing, these books and this talk. And I think, thanks, Claudia. That sums it up wonderfully. Um, to all our audience members, thank you so much for tuning in. We're so, so happy to have you here, as always. Uh, for anyone who'd like to get your hands on copies of Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid, go ahead and scroll up to that link in chat. Uh, it should be right there at the top, easy to find. Um, of course, let us know what you thought of this event, either in person, we always love to see you, um, or on social media. Social media works great too. Um, Tor, one more huge, huge thank you for being here. This has been such a pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.